Good morning, Calvary Gospel Church. Let's stand together this morning and declare our call to worship, which is Psalm 98 1. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch and I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Like the power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus, I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus, let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall He can't break through. Praise the name that makes all Second Peter 2, 1 through 9, this is what we're going to be looking at together as the Spirit helps us. The sermon title is simply, Wrath or Rescue. The key is verse 9, by the way, verse 9. 
that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Wrath, wrath or rescue. God give blessings, blessings to the preached word in Christ's name. Amen. Now, since this sermon is about heretics, in my introduction, I want to introduce to you a famous heretic of church history. In fact, he arrived in Rome just 80 years after Peter penned these words. His name was Marcion. He was the son of a bishop, and he had uh, memorized much of the Bible. But in the course of his Bible studies, he came to the conclusion that the strict, law-giving, wrathful God of the Old Testament looks nothing like the loving, compassionate, gracious God who sent Jesus Christ into this world to save us. So he decided that the Old Testament God, Yahweh, was different from the God of the New Testament. But what about all the clear biblical connection between the God of Israel and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? To solve this problem, Marcion simply rejected the Old Testament, completely did away with it. And then he took the New Testament and edited the New Testament to accommodate his theology he actually pared down the writings of Paul so that he was just left with a few of the books of Paul. And he rewrote them to really emphasize the disjunction between law and grace. Well, the early church reacted quickly and decisively against Marcion's madness and labeled him a heretic and excommunicated him. That was in the second century. But the problem of the two sides of God's character still today puzzles believers. The Bible does seem to present two sides to the same God. The God of strict judgment and the God of generous mercy. In fact, in Romans 9 and 11, Paul tells us to consider carefully both sides. He says, behold, the kindness and the severity of God. But many today, like Marcion of old, they do not like this idea of the severity of God. And so they reconfigure the Bible to fit their own personal ideas and image of God. But our text today tells us about the wrath of God. It talks to us about the rescue of God. And this is New Testament and the truth is, whether God appears as a severe judge or a loving father, it depends on our relationship to him. Three points. Three points coming out of, the, out of this text. Number one, deception. Deception. We're going back to verses one through three, but there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness. They will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. One of the most successful rackets in the world today is the selling of fake art. Even in some of the finest art galleries and private collections, these places have been invaded by paintings that are clever counterfeits of the great masters. But counterfeitism is nothing new. Satan is the first great con artist of the universe. 
He invaded the Garden of Eden to deceive Eve. You know, it's bad to tell a lie, to give wrong information, to deliberately, to tell a lie. That's injurious. To get wrong information. It's damaging. It's bad to tell a lie. It's worse to teach a lie. And it's horrific to teach a lie about God. There's nothing more offensive to God than the distortion of his holy word. To falsify the facts about who God is and what he has said. That's the basis form of blasphemy. Jesus called the devil a liar. In fact, Jesus said he's the father of lies and he doesn't show up with a red suit and horns and a pitchfork. Satan, he shows up as an angel of light to deceive people. He's a wolf. Think of it. A wolf. That's his nature. He's disguised as a beautiful, good, gentle shepherd. But he's a wolf and he infiltrates the flock to devour and to destroy and now, today, with the advent of radio and television and internet, the early trickles of trickery in the first century have now became a hurricane of heresy in the 21st century. Peter says that this onslaught of deception should not surprise us. He starts out this chapter by telling us that false prophets plagued the Hebrew people. Jeremiah complained about it. He said in chapter 5 verse 31 of his prophecy, The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and the people love to have it so. Doesn't that remind us of what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers as they turn their ears from the truth. Isaiah struggled with this. Oh, it burdened him. Isaiah chapter 30 verses 9 and 10. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And they say to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Hmm. The most destructive threat to the people of God in the Old Testament was not the army of the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Amalekites, but the false prophets within their own gates. And this is what we're facing today. Preachers are giving people what they want to hear. They're scratching carnal, itching ears. These preachers are entertaining rather than instructing people the word of the Lord. I mean, how can we be protected, not be swept away by such cunning charlatans? Well, Peter here is exposing that which is false and rotten. Peter is pulling off the mask of the phony preacher. What do they really look like? Well, he labels them as heretics. He says heresy. They are heretics. The word heresy originally meant to make a choice. But then it evolved to refer to a sect or a certain party group. Galatians 5.20 tells us that promoting a party spirit in the church is one of the works of the flesh. Whenever a church member says to another church member, are you on my side or on the pastor's side? He's promoting a party spirit. Creating friction, a faction, causing division. 
A false teacher forces you to make a choice. A choice between his novel doctrines or the great historical doctrines of the Christian church. False teachers are hard to detect because they're camouflaged. They come in under the radar. In fact, Jude tells us that these teachers creep in. Verse 4 of his epistle, for certain men have crept in unaware. The word creep means to enter into a pool so quietly that you don't even create a ripple. They come in unannounced. And of course, if you creep in, you're a creep. Peter says, they come in secretly. They're never honest and straightforward about what their operation and agenda is all about and who they are. The church would never embrace them if right up front they announced their doctrine, their intentions. But they have enough Bible truth in their vocabulary to gain entrance into the church. They get a foothold. But as time goes on, you find they minimize Bible truth. They minimize the essentials. And they begin to start sharing their heretical views, causing division. And they draw people to themselves. They're usually magnetic, attractive people. And so now in the church you have a faction, a club within the church. Not a group reflecting the, the vision and the theology of the pulpit and what the church is all about. But there's a little club within the church. And, and now people are pulled to make a choice. Will people stay with the church and the godly pastor? Or are they going to depart with this new hot new teacher who has a deeper understanding of the Bible and promotes a more pleasing, positive message. It's quite insightful when Peter tells us that they exploit people with their deceptive words. Because the word deceptive is plastos in the Greek. We get the word plastic from that. Plastic words. Words that can be easily twisted to mean anything you want them to mean. You know, today you can buy a plastic pitcher, or buy a plastic bucket, plastic plates, plastic toys. You can buy almost anything plastic. Because plastic can be molded into every possible shape. False teachers, they have plastic words. False teachers use our vocabulary, but they don't use our dictionary. Oh, they talk about sin. That's on their lips. Sin, salvation, God, Jesus Christ, resurrection. But they don't mean what the Bible means when the Bible says these words. It's a different definition. So for a false teacher, sin may simply mean failing to actualize. Failing to actualize your human potential. Salvation might mean psychological well-being. Inspiration might mean human energy and creativity. God might be simply a higher power. Jesus Christ is viewed as a moral teacher, but nothing more. Resurrection, well, that's just a metaphor for keeping Jesus alive through our devotion to his ethics. Plastic preachers. They're not interested in preserving the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints through the apostles and prophets and is now passed on generation to generation through the faithful preaching of the word of the Lord. They don't want to preserve. They're interested in progress. The goal is to modify fundamental truths and update them and redefine them into modernity. Plastic words, twisting scripture. Peter 
Peter says they deny the Lord who bought them. Does that mean they were once saved and lost it? No. These false teachers claim to be saved. They identify themselves with the church. They sing, I'm redeemed by love divine. But their lifestyle and their doctrine, that does not reflect a redeemed life. And so Peter is describing false teachers in terms of the profession of their faith. He's working with them according to the profession of their faith. And he says, but the way they practice immorality and share perverted teaching, it's obvious they're despising the lordship of Jesus Christ and proving that their profession of faith is false. What a strong warning today. Peter warning us, don't be seduced. Don't fall into these traps of having to make this choice between what is biblical and historic and great and tried and proven to some novelty that takes us away from the lordship of Jesus Christ. Deception! But then the second word is destruction. You saw it in verses 4 through 6. For if God spared not the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Destruction. Peter sees no bright future for these heretics and those that follow them. Their doom is sealed. Judgment is sure, though it's not yet come. No matter how secure sinners might feel... The judgment of God finally does come. And Peter demonstrates this with three examples. Judgment fell on the angels. It fell on the old world. And it fell on the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at the height of God's wrath. Sinning angels falling from heaven. Look at the breadth of God's wrath. The entire world washed away in the days of Noah. Look at the depth of God's wrath. Sodom and Gomorrah buried under the Dead Sea. Divine wrath. Here's exhibit A. Peter says the angels who sinned. I mean... The angels are a higher order of being than man. A lofty status in God's universe. But God did not hesitate to punish them. Think of it. These angels at one time worshipped at the throne of God. Obeyed every command. Enjoyed the glories of God's presence. But God did not spare them. A third of the angels followed the rebellion of Lucifer, a rebellion that was conceived in his heart through pride. And then Peter is telling us that some of the angels were more wicked and powerful than other angels. And God decided to take some of these fallen angels and chain them into the darkest part of hell. Exhibit B for Peter. The old world. The old world before the deluge. I tell you, before there was a physical flood, there was a flood of evil. That ancient world filled with violence. Marriage was a merry-go-round. Moral relativism. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. A pornographic society. Genesis 6 says that the imaginations of the people were evil only evil continuously. And they didn't like the preaching of Noah. Oh yeah, you didn't know Noah was a preacher? 
Does that surprise you? He didn't just build a boat. Peter says he was a preacher of righteousness. But they mocked him. Hey, old man, what are you doing big, building that boat way out here in land far away from the sea? Noah said, it's going to rain. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. Your only hope of survival is to get into this ship, thus repenting of your sin. But they laughed. Oh, Noah, you're wrong. We looked at the weather forecast. Topper said it's going to be sunny skies. We don't even know what rain is. What are you talking about? Water coming out from the heavens? God waters the earth with heavy dew every morning. We don't know what you're talking about. And God loves us. He would never, he would never send that kind of a judgment. But the rain came. Not only was the water coming down, but the floods of the earth were broken up. Waters unleashed from inside the earth. And there was the flood. Exhibit Z, or exhibit C for Peter, the story of Sodom. The story of Sodom. Now usually... When we think of Sodom, we think of one particular sin, the sin of homosexuality. But you had to see that perversion in the larger context of a culture that was disconnected from God. I'm going to surprise you with something. I'm going to read one verse, Ezekiel 16, 49. This lists the sins of Sodom. And before it talks about the abomination which was the homosexuality. There's some other things listed. The sins of Sodom, Ezekiel 16 and 49. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty, committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Sodom was guilty of a lot of sins. In their prosperity, they had forgotten God. They had too much time on their hands and they were lazy. They didn't think about the poor and the needy. They were prideful, unthankful, rebellious. And in that carnal, complacent society, the sin of sexual perversion was able to get rooted and then to bring forth its destructive, poisonous fruit. And God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Raining down fire and brimstone. Yes, I'm a fire and brimstone preacher. And I don't apologize for it. Peter is warning us, don't play games with God. You play games with God, you're playing with fire. For God is a consuming fire. Destruction. And then we finally think about deliverance. Deliverance. We always end on a high note. A happy note because that's the gospel Verses 7 through 9. And delivered righteous Lot. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them. Tormented his righteous soul from day to day. Seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. That the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Now I'll be honest with you. A message like this causes us to tremble. And it should. I trembled as I studied this and wrote this. We get anxious. Will I make it? You know, there's clear and present danger. Will I be protected? When judgment comes, will I be swept away with the wicked? Does God know who I am, where I am? Questions weigh heavy on us with a message like this. They should weigh heavy on us. But we have encouragement. Peter says the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Oh, hallelujah. 
He knows how to rescue us from all of our trials, all of our dangers, all of our troubles, all of our problems, all of our weaknesses, all of our temptations. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who in the midst of that temptation will make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. He is faithful. He preserves his people. In the midst of this infiltration of wolves and sheep's clothing, Jesus said in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. I know them. I know them by name. They will not follow a stranger. They will flee from a stranger because they do not know the voice of a stranger. I tell you that our great, beautiful shepherd is in the midst of his people today. He's in the church. We are the flock of God, the people of God. We know his voice. And he delivers us. His presence is with us. He speaks to us through a message like this. And we hear his divine voice and warning. Hallelujah. When judgment came, Lot was pulled up out of that city of destruction. Before the flood came, God shut Noah into that boat and preserved him. There's rescue. We're not marked for judgment in the future, but for escape and deliverance. How did God deliver Lot? God gave to Lot spiritual sensitivity. Isn't that something? He was tormented by his environment. The filthy condent. He lived in a cesspool. And his soul was tormented. Now, you know Lot was not a super saint. We study Lot to learn about carnality. A carnal Christian. He shouldn't have been in Sodom in the first place. And now he's a governor, a mayor in Sodom, living, sitting at the gate. He had perks and prominence in Sodom. He shouldn't have been there. There was a little bit of worldliness in Lot, but the Bible says he was a righteous man. Peter said he's a righteous man. Why? Because he had the same faith as Uncle Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Lot had the right faith and he was counted righteous, but he was miserable. Our great security against sin lies in being shocked at it. When we're shocked at something, we avoid it at all costs. What about us? When we look around us, are we shocked? Are we distressed? When we turn on the TV and see the vulgarity and the blasphemy and the perversion, how do we react? Do we laugh at it? Or does it burden us and cause us to blush? God rescued Lot by giving him spiritual sensitivity. How did God rescue Noah? God gave him holy conviction. Hebrews eleven seven 7 says... By faith, Noah, being warned of things to come, not yet seen, he moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is through faith. Now I want to tell you that Noah's faith paid off his investment of faith. Faith isn't just being spared by God, it's being blessed by God. Now, nobody thought Noah was making a good investment. Because, I mean, can you imagine the commitment of Noah? 120 years building a boat every weekend, every night. Working, he and his three boys working. They spent every extra dollar, emptied their savings on lumber and nails and tools. And there they were, building, investing everything, energy, time, blueprints on that boat. Everybody said, well, you're, Noah, you're waste. What a stupid investment. What was everybody else doing? Buying and selling. 
building houses, collecting properties, enjoying themselves, investing in business operations and enterprises. Let me tell you about their investments. The day it started raining, the stock market crashed. The banks closed. The coins were worthless. The houses were washed away. All their investments were nothing. Let me tell you about Noah's investment. He sat on that boat, a cruise ship. He got a cruise ship for 150 days. And then when he walked off that boat, the sun was shining, the storm was over, and he owned the whole earth. Every elephant, every oak tree, every pine tree, everything on earth belonged to him. And now it was clean, it was washed, it was prepared and given to him as a gift by God Almighty. I'm telling you that faith won't just spare you. Faith will reward you. Faith will exalt you. Faith will bless you. The meek still will inherit the earth. Music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your. Much deeper. 